Well, uh, I'm super excited to be here with you guys on a cold Sunday. Um, I'm glad that you guys made it. I'm sure there's tons of people that thought about it. Uh, some might even say they prayed about it. And, uh, and, and they felt that the Lord was leading them uh, to be at home this morning. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to be here with you guys. We're starting a brand new series today. It's only a two-part series, so it's quite short. Um, we're talking about mental health over these next two weeks. And so quite a serious topic. Uh, and we're trying to figure out uh, what does the Bible say about our mental health? Um, is it important to God? And, uh, and so uh, this morning, my uh, desire, my hope, my prayer uh, is that we would, uh, in this short brief time, just uh, unpack a little bit about what we are to think about our minds. Um, and, and what is our response uh, to God with regards to our minds? And then next week, uh, Lord willing, uh, very similar to the uh, politics series that we did, uh, to have someone, a professional who also loves the Lord, uh, to come and chat to us a little bit more about our minds and about mental health. And so that's what we're doing over these next two weeks. And, uh, and so there's still a tremendous opportunity to invite family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, uh, folks that you know uh, who, you, who are wrestling with this. We're trying to make sense of, of their mental health and, and maybe are asking the question, what does God say about my mental well-being? Uh, how should I think about my mind, uh, not just as a Christian, but as a, as a human being, as an image bearer of God? And so uh, we've titled this uh, series, You Are Not Alone. You're not alone. Um, this is something that we believe here at Rooted Fellowship. Uh, we say it all the time that God has not created us to live in isolation, but we have been beautifully designed for fellowship. You are not alone. And so even uh, on this issue of mental health and mental well-being, you are not alone. You might be sitting here thinking, man, I'm, I'm the only one that's going through this, that nobody understands. No, 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 you are not alone. And again, my hope is that I would show you uh, through the text, uh, that's what God is saying, that you are not alone. Now, before we jump in, permit me to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me. Uh, that God would do a work that only he can do. And that's ultimately that he would save many, but in that also that he would heal many, restore many, reconcile many. And so, Father God, we thank you for just your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you for your word, uh, that these words may be old and ancient, but they're not dead. They are very much alive. And so, God, uh, would you meet us where we are through your word? By the power of the Holy Spirit, would you engage us Father, I pray for those who are wrestling and struggling right now, Lord. I pray that they would have a massive encounter with you, that they would leave here completely different to how they came in. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name, we pray. Amen. Now, I need you to know that your mental health matters to God. Your mental health matters to God. In fact, pursuing mental health is one of the ways that we love God with our mind. What you do with your mind matters to God. Uh, let, me, let me show you. You see, in the, in the Old Testament, we see that the people of God... Uh, had a morning and evening prayer that they called Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Alehenu Adonai Echad. See, this, this prayer was, was actually a declaration of faith. It was their declaration of their faith in God. It affirms that, that God is, is the only God. That's, that's what they are declaring, that he is Lord over all, and, and that there are implications to that. There are implications to this truth, and those implications, they, they ripple through our every being, the, the fiber of who we are, of, of everything around us. The Shema can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. From verse 4, it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. 
And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Let me read it to you in the Christian Standard Bible. That's the, 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 the translation that I love to preach from. It says, listen, Israel. Listen, Rooted Fellowship. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are, are to be in your heart, the Shema. Friends, this is where Jesus gets the, the first part of what we've come to know as the great commandment. You see, when asked of all the commandment that God gives us, which is the most important? Mark chapter 12 from verse 28, one of the scribes approached when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well. He asked him, which command is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. He quotes the Shema, but I, I hope that you see something big here. J Jesus, yes, he quotes the Shema, but then, but then he adds to it. Now, you might be thinking, Oni, I thought we were not supposed to add to God's word. Well, you'd be correct. You can't. But the one who is the word I'm pretty sure heaven celebrates every time he adds to it. So this is important. If Jesus is adding, then we need to be listening. L look closely with me. See, remember Deuteronomy 6.5 says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus says in Mark 12 verse 30, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus adds your mind. He adds your mind to the command. Why? B because your mind matters to God. And look, it's not like it didn't before, right? It's, it's, it's not like it didn't before, but rather it, it, it's like Jesus is going, it's necessary for me to communicate this to you. The command is clear. You love God with everything, but, but, but for some reason, the, the evil one, this is Satan, tries and, with, and, and sometimes convinces us that, that you, can, you can have salvation, that you can surrender everything to God, but, but you can keep your mind. It's like Jesus is watching us lose our minds and goes, okay, hold on, hold on, everyone. Let's talk a little bit about loving God. Because clearly you guys are missing it. You need to love God with your mind as well. That's why I started by saying pursuing mental health is one of the ways that we love God with our minds. You've heard me say this before, but let me say it again. What you think, you feel. And what you feel you do. What you think, you feel. And what you feel, you do. That's why it matters what you think. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I, 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 God, I, I love, I love, I really love God's word, and, and I love unpacking it, as, as many of you would know this. And so when I read a verse like this, sometimes I just like to read it in reverse, right, just so that it sinks in deeper, and so I go, you, you want to know the perfect will of God? You want to do what is pleasing? You want to discern what is good? Then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul is saying, guys, if, if, if you want to love God, if, if you want to please him, if you want to be in his will, then your mind matters. 
It matters. Now, I could talk a lot about mental health and mental well-being, and we could unpack a variety of conditions that, that, that keep us from flourishing mentally. But for the sake of time, let's chat about one that I believe all of us struggle with to varying degrees, right? I, I believe uh, all of us struggle with this one to varying degrees. See, m- much of mental health stems from this. And, and so to some degree, if, if we can be mindful of it, this is to be aware of it, and if we can figure out how to tackle this issue, then, then I believe we have a good chance of standing strong and thriving in the area of mental health. I really do. And so having said that, let's talk a little bit about anxiety. Let's talk a little bit about anxiety. Anyone wrestle with anxiety? Anyone anxious? Maybe not right now, but at some point in your life. Any, anyone? Okay, great. For a moment, I thought I was the only one. I was about to pack up and leave. What is anxiety? Well, to simply put it, anxiety is, is, is a feeling of fear, dread, and uneasiness. Simply put. And we can, we can divide anxiety into two categories. Now, look, let me go ahead and say this right out the gates. I'm by no means a professional on this. We have many of those in the room. But I've done my homework. All right, so you can trust me. <laughs> we can divide anxiety into two categories what they call acute anxiety and chronic anxiety. Acute anxiety is is the stress, the worry, the discomfort you feel as a direct result of a specific situation or event. For example, it's acute when you are running late for an appointment and you begin to feel the symptoms of stress, such as uneasiness, and, and maybe it becomes difficult to focus. Many of us go through that. But then there's also what they call chronic anxiety. This is the the stress, the worry, the discomfort that builds up from repeated exposure to stressful situations. Many things can lead to chronic stress, including factors such as difficult relationships or or, or job demands or, or financial difficulties. Let me give you some symptoms of both. Acute and chronic. Uh, Symptoms of of acute anxiety include aggression, insomnia, fear, mood swings, difficulty concentrating, irritability. Again, some of you are very familiar to those. Symptoms of chronic anxiety, well, they include uh, ongoing stress disorders, perpetual irritability or anger, depression, isolation, aches and pains, intense fatigue. Over time, chronic anxiety can lead to additional complications, like, but not limited to, weight gain or loss, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, acne and other skin concerns, a low sex drive. That's just for married folks, okay? Just putting it out there. Stomach ulcers, digestive issues, heart health concerns, type 2 diabetes. This is, guys, this is serious stuff. That, that anxiety, if, 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 we, if we let it loose, can have massive implications on our bodies. Anxiety has the ability to breed discontentment, depression, heartache, post-traumatic stress disorder, despair, hopelessness, and the list goes on and on and on. You might be sitting in a pit and going, why, why am I here? When when the rest of my life looks great, maybe job is going well, I've got some good relationships, but why am I here? You might have allowed anxiety to take hold of your life. And, And can I say, can I say, people in the Bible were not immune to this. This, this, is, this is not just a today issue. This, 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 is, this is a Genesis 3, since Genesis 3 issue, 
when sin entered the world. And so, and so you shouldn't think, you know what, this is, it's us living in 2024 that we're wrestling with this. So when, when we read the Bible, it's like, these people never struggled with this. No, no, that's not true. Your, some of your favorite Bible people wrestled with this. King, King David was depressed. Job was hopeless. Elijah was suicidal. King Solomon hated life. This perpetual, like perpetually discontent. Jeremiah wished he was never born. You are not alone. And what I love about, about reading these stories is that it, it tells us the Bible doesn't hide these things. But we do. We do. We can read about these things and, and instead of going, hold on, listen, may, may, maybe I should talk to someone. Maybe I should be transparent and vulnerable. No, 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 we, we choose to hide. But we shouldn't. I mean, look, let's, let's hear from, from the Apostle Paul, of which many of us are familiar with him. He wrote most of the New Testament. So let's, let's, let's maybe read a little bit from him on this, on this issue of being anxious on the matter of anxiety. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, do not worry about anything. Other translations say, do not be anxious about anything. Easier said than done, Paul. But before we throw away these words by Paul, because I know, I know, sometimes we'll go, well, Paul just doesn't understand. You know, Paul was an apostle. Paul, Paul was to, to, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Like, you know, that's Paul. He had a cape and everything. So it makes sense for him to say that. But, so before we do that, before we, we, we throw his words away, we, we should remember where Paul is writing this from. It's not from a home office on the beachfront or the corner office on the 11th floor. No. Paul is writing this from prison. T to be specific, he's under house arrest, courtesy of the Romans. The, the place where you should be anxious. The place where you should be worried about everything. And, and so Paul is going, I get it. I get it. I get your situation. Whatever, whatever it is that you're going through that has you believing and feeling that there is no way out. Paul says, I get it, and he still says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. And I love the fact that he doesn't, he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't, he doesn't just say, don't be anxious, and then it's a full stop. Now, I know that the English language puts a comma between this section of, of, of not being anxious and then what he says next. Um, but, but in the Greek, there is no pause. Paul just keeps going. Paul's solution to, to, to not being anxious is not, hey, why don't you just pretend and perform? Hey, don't be anxious, comma, just pretend and perform. You, you'd think that that's what he says, especially the way that we live today. And when I say we, I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about Christians I mean, the, the, like we've perfected the art of pretending and performing. Like we're so, we're so good at it that, that I think sometimes maybe non-Christians will think it's the 11th commandment. But he, does, he doesn't say that. He doesn't, he doesn't say to no, just pretend and perform. He doesn't, he doesn't say just stuff it down and hope for the best. He doesn't just say pull your socks up. He doesn't say just toughen up. That's not what he says. Paul doesn't say any of those things, but rather, read with me, he says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. There's a few things to highlight here. Number one, Paul brings up prayer. He says, don't be anxious about anything, and then he, he offers us prayer. Paul says, take your focus off your situation and fix your gaze on God. I mean, wh why do we pray? Wh why do we pray? 
it, it's more than just asking for stuff. I mean, some, some of us, that's like, that's the sum total of prayer. It's like, I just, I just want to ask for stuff. But it's, it's more than that. In fact, I think we need to take a step back before we do that and recognize why we pray, why God has given us prayer. We, we pray, or when we pray, two things are happening. One, we are recognizing that we are not in control. We are recognizing that we do not have infinite wisdom. We are recognizing that we cannot be everywhere at all times, despite what Google has you thinking. And the sad thing about it is that for most of us, that recognizing only happens when we are in desperate need, when, when life's falling apart. But when life's good, oh no, we, we think we're in control. We, we think we know it all. We tell Jesus, just take a back seat, I've got this. Go help someone else. Have, have you seen, have you, is there, is there a, there's no Tabo in this church, right? I don't think so. Okay, like have you seen Tabo's life? Maybe you need to go help him. And, and if your name is Tabo and, and you need help, then by the, come on, we're going to pray for you. It, it's recognizing that we are not in control. The second reason that we pray is because we're saying that he's in control. That's what's happening in prayer. Before we get to the asking for stuff, it's, it's going, hold on, I am not in control. And I'm going to cry out to the one who is. I'm going to cry out to the one who is seated on his throne. And so Paul is going, hey, don't be anxious. Recognize that God is here. Recognize that he is seated on his throne. That you are not alone. Prayer is recognizing that there is a connection between you and God. That there is a relationship between you and God. That you can boldly approach the throne of grace. Like a, like a, like a little child who boldly approaches their father. It doesn't matter what's happening. I love it, and I see it all the time here. Little kids running up to their parents. They don't care who you're having a conversation with. They don't care that you're praying your heart out and casting out demons. They'll just be like, Papa! I want a hot chocolate. I'm like, bro, I'm casting out demons here. Can you not see? I'm on call. That, like, 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 that's the kind of relationship that we have with God. It's only a child who can, who can wake up a king in the middle of the night and ask for milk. And, and the king loves it. Some of you need to know that, that God loves it. He loves it when you come to him, when you recognize him for who he is. And so Paul says, don't, don't be anxious. Recognize what you have, who you have. He says, pray. Number two, Paul then says, petition. Other translations say supplication. They use the word supplication, but petition. I love that word. The Greek word here is, is deces, which, which means an urgent or intense request. Petition. So Paul says, recognize the connection, then make the request known. I find that interesting. Paul, are you maybe saying that some of us are just throwing out requests but actually haven't recognized who we're crying out to? That, that we've become so familiar God, I need this, and I need this, and I like, you know like when someone asks you for something, but they don't even look at you? It's like they don't even see that you, it's like, yeah, yeah, can you just, just, just quick, just do that thing quickly. Paul's saying, don't, don't do that. Recognize then petition. This, this petition, this, this word is, is the language of the court to petition. And one who petitions in a courtroom, has thought very hard about how to petition, has carefully analyzed the situation, and, and, then, and then lays out everything thoughtfully to petition. They also recognize who sits before them. It's the judge. And any good lawyer knows that to ensure your appeal is well heard, they will honor the judge. 
and they will do as he or she communicates. I mean, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, 23 to 31, we read about Abigail, who quickly got off the donkey and knelt down with her face to the ground in reverence to David as she intercedes with him for the life of her husband. She, she, she recognizes who David is. She gets off her donkey and then she goes on her knees and petitions. What's your posture when you, become, when you come before God? When you petition before him, what is, what is your posture? Friends, we... We shouldn't fall into the trap of treating God like he's one of our homies. Yes, his his grace and his mercy and his love are beautiful things, but they are not a reason for us to disrespect or dishonor God. Don't, Don't let the mishaps of culture bleed into your relationship with God. Because we now live in a time where it's like, well, we don't care about honor. We don't. And so we talk to people however we want. We address them however we want. And, and, and then we bring that into our relationship with God. Now, I get it. He is your friend. He loves you. He is your father. But he is still king of kings and lord of lords. Yeah. And so have you... Have you ever petitioned before God? When last did you kneel before God? When when last did you think about what is it that I want to say? Not just a throwaway prayer, but God, I've I've wrestled through your word, and, and, and here's what I'm longing for. Some of you need to learn how to write out your prayers. You'll quickly realize that I'm like, what am I doing here? What am I saying here? Have you seen some of Paul's prayers? That's a man who petitions because he recognizes who he is crying out to. And so we petition. But in order to petition when you are experiencing anxiety, it requires you to be honest about what's going on. Think about that for a moment. God, I'm struggling. Okay. About what? Like what's going on? What's really going on? It's about being honest. It's about being transparent. And here's here's the thing. God already knows. So, So you're not trying to convince him. It didn't take him by surprise. Whatever it is that you're going through, it didn't take him by surprise. God already knows. He wants you to know what's going on. In the garden, when when, when God goes, Adam, after that sin, Adam, where where are you? It's not like it's not like God lost his children. It's like I've got like you know, like we lose our keys, like, oh, where where did Ronnie go? Where is he hiding? No, that's not what's happening. He's trying to get you to realize where you are. Because you're so good at pretending and performing, you've convinced yourself that you're okay when you're not. And many of us can see that you're not okay. How are you today? Oh, I feel great. Highly favored. God is good all the time. <laughs> and we look behind you and we're like, but your whole life's burning. Like, it's, it's in flames. No, I'm great. I'm d- d- don't ignore that. It's just a braai. <laughs> just braaiing some meat. See, when we, when we petition, when we petition, when... When I petition for the, for the health of my daughter, it is, it is me going, God, I need to recognize that, that, they are, that there is fear there, that there is, there, there is control there, that, that there is doubt there, that, that, that this anxiety has gotten me to this place where, where, where I'm believing the lie that, that, that I love my child more than you do. That this fist in the air, how, 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 how dare I, Lord? And so I fall on my knees. And I say, God, I am desperate 
I am desperate for you, for you to come and for you to do a work that only you can do. See, for, for the child of God, it's us recognizing that we are before the King of kings and the Lord of lords who hears our petitions. I don't know how this works, but it does. God has the ability to hear every single petition all across the world from every single child. So Paul says, reject anxiety by praying and petitioning. And then, number three, he says that we are to give thanks. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, this one was a little bit confusing. I'm not going to lie. Because maybe you're like me. You might be thinking, but, but what am I giving thanks for? I'm still in the same situation. Like, what am, what am I giving thanks for, Paul? What are you giving thanks for? Last I checked, you're still in prison. Well, we, we give thanks for what God has done in our lives. We give thanks for what he has already done in our lives. You see, to, to look forward to God's faithfulness and goodness, you must look back on his faithfulness and goodness. Let me say that again. To look forward to God's faithfulness and goodness, you must look back to his faithfulness and goodness. It's to trace his grace from the very beginning. All the way from the beginning to where you are now. To see his fingerprints of grace all through your life. It's a great place to start. A great place to start for the Christian is your salvation. How far back should I go? Go to your salvation. If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, then you go back to your salvation, the day that you were rescued from spending eternity separated from God. You go back to that moment and you go, you know what, I recognize God's faithfulness and goodness to me because he sent his son to die for me. See, to, to live a life of ingratitude, thanklessness, and unappreciativeness is to not recognize the grace and love which God has shown you through his son, Jesus Christ. And I know, I know it's easier, easier to, to say than to actually put into practice, but hear me, friends, it is possible. It is possible to be in the midst of a struggle and still go, you know what, I can see the faithfulness and the goodness of God. How, on it? By the power of the Spirit. Because if you're going to try to do this on your own power, I'm telling you now, you're not going to last. You'll maybe get to Monday lunchtime. Maybe. But if you press in to the power of the Spirit, this is possible. This is how Paul has the ability to write all these letters from prison. To go, you know, guys, don't, hey man, don't worry, but let me tell you about the goodness of God. I know you're worried about these chains that I'm in, but, but let me tell you how faithful he is. Let me tell you how merciful he is. Let me ask you this. If you received nothing else in this life but the gospel, would you be thankful? That's a question all of us need to sit with. If, if you receive nothing else, all your goals, ambitions, desires, no. What about this relationship, marriage, children? No. I've got the sickness. What about healing? No. If you receive nothing else in this life but the gospel, would you be thankful? If all that you got was the blood of Jesus that saves you from eternal punishment, would you be grateful and content? question worth asking. My prayer, not just for you, but for me, is that we would answer yes. Because we recognize that in receiving the gospel, we've received everything. 
that in receiving the gospel, we have received everything. More than we deserve. To, to not think this way is two things are, are potentially happening. It means that you don't understand the magnitude and the beauty of the gospel. That's what it means. Is, is that you've gone, no, hold on, like, yeah, it's, it's amazing, and, and we hear you every Sunday talk about it and we sing about it, but have you seen this car? Have you seen this place? Have you eaten this food? You cannot compare anything to the gospel. No marriage, no, no relationship with kids, and I, I, know, I know, I know, I'm stepping on toes now. But you, can, you cannot compare anything to the gospel. Nothing. And, and so when, when, when we go, mm, it, it just, it simply means that, that we don't understand how big the gospel is and how beautiful and how marvelous it is. And sometimes, man, like, I think even in the way that we sing, how, how do you sing like this? I'm blown away by the gospel. Oh, look, look at Jesus in my life. Oh, did I get a message? I don't, like, and I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be that guy, and this isn't that, you know, uh, work-based, whatever. No, no, it's not that. But I'm, I know, if, if, I, if I spend enough time with you, I know the thing that you are most passionate about. I'll figure it out. You can't stop talking about it. You make time for it. You'll sacrifice anything for it. You'll give up anything and everything for it. What the Bible tells us is that Jesus far outweighs anything, anything, anything that you think will sustain you and give you joy. Okay, well, I hear you, but what if, what if I'm not a Christian? What if I'm not a Christian? Can, can I be thankful? I'm going to say yes. Yes, you can. You can read this verse and go, yeah, I think I can be thankful. How, on it? Well, it's my understanding that it's different, first and foremost. And it's different because your, your gratitude stems from the fact that you are still alive and are in a position to still receive the gospel. That's why you're thankful. I want you to think about that for a moment. The fact that you, that you are still alive, that you still have breath, that you still have the ability to bend the knee and make the confession that Jesus, you are Lord, that is mercy. I am so thankful. I cannot thank God enough that he kept me alive long enough to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, the greatest gift ever given. That at the age of 19, I, I surrendered my life to him, and I'm just like, wow, I could, I could have gone out before that and be separated from him forever. So you can be thankful. And my hope is that, that as you recognize that, that it draws you closer to Jesus, to surrendering your life to him. Like I said, to look forward to God's faithfulness and goodness, you must look back on his faithfulness and goodness. And so, and so Paul says, don't be anxious. Pray. Petition. Be thankful. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 7, and the peace of God. We love this verse. Yeah. We love to quote it. We'll buy the coffee mugs with it. If you're in tattoo, into tattoos, you might tattoo it on, maybe. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts. And, and, there it is. In Christ Jesus. We love this, but we fail to recognize that there's something that comes before it. Yeah. That, 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 if, that if you want to live this way, then you've got to recognize what comes before it. And what is it? Prayer, petition, thanksgiving. See, when you really pray about your problems and challenges and do so with a thankful posture, the word of God says, God will give you peace. And what you need to know here is, is when he talks about peace, he's not, he's not talking about, listen, you know what, 
I'm going to completely change the circumstances. I'm going to take that thing out of your life. I'm gonna, that's not what he's saying. That's a prosperity gospel, and that's an evil gospel from the very depths of hell. You, you can still have the sickness and have peace. You, you, you can still wrestle with things, but yet still have peace. You can still navigate challenging realities and still have peace. But don't take it from me. Take it from the man sitting in prison and in persecution. But doing so in peace and in utter dependence upon God. Imagine if Paul was like, like, like us. We wouldn't have much of the New Testament. He'd still be waiting for God to change the circumstances. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, no, I'm not going to do anything until, until you, you change this. And it's like, no, you're, you're failing to recognize that the, the, the peace that I give you, that's why, that's why it says here, which surpasses all understanding, it's when people look at your life and they're like, I don't get it. H how, how are you so thankful? H how do you still find joy? How? Prayer, petition, thanksgiving. I just do what the Bible tells me to do. But maybe you might be going, oh, I get Paul. C can we really live this way? Okay, cool. You may not be feeling Paul, no problem. Well, let me tell you where he got it from. Some of you are not going to like this one. From Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, verse 27, he says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Whoa. Just stop reading. Like, I know it's on the screen. If there was a way that we could, like, take it out, you know, it'd be cool. Because <laughs> what I'd do is I'd go, okay, guys, what gift do you want? And what gift do you want? It's from Jesus. Jesus, who, who Colossians 1 tells us that, that all things were created in him, like, it's him, it's Jesus. And he's saying, I'm leaving you with a gift. I'm telling you, oh, my list would be, would be quite something. Some of you would be like, what, I didn't know. Yes, I, I want it. <laughs> I want it. But he says, peace of mind and heart. J Jesus recognizes that the, the gift that you need, the gift that you need is peace of mind and heart. Do you believe that that's the gift that you need? And then he says, and the peace I give as a gift, the world cannot give. So, so right here, he's telling us, stop running to all those things that you're hoping to find peace in. He's, a, he's a, the creator of the world is telling you that the world cannot give you the peace that he gives. So stop. Some of us today, that's what we need to do. What is your next step? It's to stop running to the things of the world, hoping to find peace in them. And then he goes on to say, so don't be troubled or afraid. If you have this gift, don't be troubled or afraid. And you would think that that, that settles it, right? I mean, we should be able to amen, close, sing song, benediction, go home. But no, Paul continues to write because he, he knows us. He knows us. Look at verse 8. He continues to say, Finally, brothers and sisters, let's stop there. Gosh, this feels like a really cool Bible study, right? Finally, brothers and sisters. Finally, who? Finally, who? It's like you guys don't believe it. It's almost like you don't want it. It's like, mm -mm, I don't want community. Mm -mm. I know what he's going to say. I know he's going to talk about fellowship, but I don't want it. No. Finally, this is addressed to the community. It's addressed to the fellowship. This, this screams, you are not alone. And so don't believe the lie. Because he will do everything. The evil one will do everything in his limited power to whisper in your ear and convince you that, you know what, you shouldn't tell anybody about that. Because you're the only one. What will they think of you? You're a leader. And you're gonna take, you're gonna say that up front? You're gonna tell them that you're wrestling with fear and, and, and you have control issues and, and you have sin in your life and you, you're so anxious that you can't sleep. You're gonna, 
don't do that. And yet, Paul addresses brothers and sisters. He's saying, hey guys, I, I need you guys to know that you're in this together. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and, and if there's anything praiseworthy, guys, I'm like, whatever is true, what is the most truest thing? You can give the Sunday school answer. The name of the Son of God. <laughs> We're recording this, guys, please. What is the truest thing out there? Thank you. We can edit that part. Make you guys look great. What is the most honorable thing? What is the most just? What, who's the most purest? Jesus. Who's the most lovely? Jesus. The most commendable? You, I hope you're getting it. He's, he's going, brothers and sisters, I just need to point you back to Jesus. I need to point you to, and you need to be pointing one another to Jesus. Jesus is, is the only one who is all these things in perfection. Oh, but my three-year-old is so pure. Just wait. Just wait. He's the only one. He's the only one that is all these things in perfection. And so my question is why? Why would you settle for anything less? Why? Why would you go anywhere else? Dwell on these things, Paul says. Dwell on these things. Dwell, or some translations say, think on these things. The, the Greek word here is meant to give us a picture of a, of, a, of, a, of a mathematician working on a complex equation. Paul is, is pleading to us to have the same intentional, continual examination on the attributes of Jesus. Have you ever seen that? Those, those mathematicians with the board. I mean, they just, they're looking at it the whole time and, and adding to it and being blown away and then going home and working on it and then talking to their peers and then coming back and then bringing their peers and going, guys, this is amazing. It's incredible. That's what he's saying to us. To dwell on these things. To think on these things. See, for some of us, the first steps towards help, the, the first step towards help is realizing that you are not alone. Maybe that's what you came to hear this morning. Maybe that's a great place to, to end it all, right? Had more stuff, but hold on, I'm, I'm going to skip it. I might have the band come up. Because, because I think this is so important. It's so important that, that because we, we, live, we live in a, a world that, that is, there's this growing kind of just individualistic kind of you do you, you be on your own, you tough it up, you pull your own socks up. You, like, and, and maybe what you need to hear this morning is you're not alone. That, that anxiety, like that anxiety, like even, even me saying this, that hey guys, you know, you should like get into community already starting to make you feel anxious. You are not alone. That's the, fir the first step for you is to, is to realize that you are not alone. It's denouncing the lie that nobody cares. That nobody understands. I want you to know that Jesus does. Maybe the, the person next to you may not understand, but Jesus does. Jesus does. If you don't think so, I'd encourage you to go read the garden He's, what happens in, as he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, Jesus does understand. I mean, he understands so much that he, he, he in a sense, he, he creates this community, and then he says, why don't you get plugged into this community? Because it's one of the ways that I'm going to help. It's one of the ways that I engage. It's one of the ways that I, like, I, I meet you where you are. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says this, says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. 
This great cloud of witnesses are all those who have gone before us. Go read Hebrews 11. And I believe they are looking at your situation and they're going, yeah, I understand. They're going, yeah, I've been there before. They're going, I totally get it. I totally get it. And yet at the same time, they are crying out for you to keep your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. They are saying, don't give up, don't give in. Get plugged in. One of the ways that, that God cares for us, man, we say it all the time, and, and, and you might be sitting here going, gosh, man, this church is about community. It's about community, and they're constantly trying to do things to get us in community. It's because on your own, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. So if you need help, get help. If you need help, get help. Look, hear me. Everyone look at me. It's okay to not be okay. Okay? It's okay to not be okay. It's not okay to stay not okay. There is a difference. And so if you need help, get help. Get help. And you might be sitting going, well, how much help do I need? How, how deep should I go? Well, I would say the degree of your anxiety or mental unhealth determines the depth of help you need. There is a difference between a common cold and COVID-19. They both indicate that you're not well, but they have different degrees of care. The point is this, is that you're getting help. And we all need it. We all need it. There is no one in this room who is perfect. No one. We all need help. What I need you to know is that there is no shame in getting help. Gosh, I want I want us to be a, a community that that speaks about our challenges, that speaks about our anxiety and our depression and our isolation, our loneliness, our insomnia. We, we speak about this. Now, look, and I understand that there's maturity to this and, and our leaders are incredibly mature, some of the most mature I've ever been around, but we speak about these things. We don't pretend, we don't go, no, no, we're a, we're a perfect church. And then when things happen, we go, how on earth, like what was going on? There is no shame in getting help. There is no shame in coming up front and going, you know what, I need prayer, I need help, where do I go, what's my next step? There is no shame in that. We run to God and we run to community. We run to a community that points us to God. One, I haven't said much about like therapy and medication, like are you, are you against that? No. Not at all. God heals through prayer and pills. God works through miracles and medicine. All of it is in His sovereign hand. So I'm not against it. I'm not. But it's that recognizing that it's God who is in control. And then going, God, what is the, the, the plan that you've laid out for me in the context of community so that I can receive the help that I need? I am not against medical experts getting in. No, next week we're going to have one. A professional who loves Jesus and is just going, yeah, 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 listen, there, there's some things that are just kind of beyond what your pastor can give you. But it's not separate from God. And so, Paul closes by saying this, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. I love how the New Living Translation puts it. It says, keep putting into practice. This is not a one and done thing. So some of us are on the other side of, of the challenge that we've just experienced, but you gotta keep putting into practice. 
You've got to keep dwelling on these things, thinking on these things. Let me close with how I started. Because I cannot say this enough. Your mental health matters to God. Pursuing mental health is one of the ways we love God with our mind. If you're going to receive the help you need, if you want to see your mind transformed to this reality, the reality of a peace that surpasses all understanding, then you must believe God cares about your mental health. And so my question to you this morning is, do you? Do you believe He cares about your mental health? Friends, this matter of our minds, the incredible complex mystery that dwells between our temples. It is a matter of life and death. On the one hand, there must be a a conscious rejection of all that is not agreeable with the mind of Christ, a rejection of fear. And on the other, there must also be a conscious taking on of exalted thoughts. And not only thinking of them, but practicing them daily so that the mind of Christ shines out into the darkness. Amen? You are not alone. You are loved more than you could ever imagine. God cares about you all of you and that includes your mind and so let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds let us surrender our minds to him let us walk in this peace that Jesus gives as a gift a peace that surpasses all understanding and so Father God we we ask that you would do this thing this thing that I I feel like in the church is, is often not spoken of. It's, it's, it's the thing that we, we don't want to dive into. We maybe don't quite understand it or we, we just don't want to talk about it. But as we think of the Shema, as we think of the great commandment, as we, as we recognize that Jesus, you have come to rescue us and all of us, our minds and our hearts, our soul, our entire beings that you care about us I pray that we would know that that we would believe it that we would trust you Jesus would you be our firm foundation the temptation is to run to so many other things hope believing that they will hold us but they cannot you are our firm foundation the rock on which we stand. And so, Father, I pray that even now as we respond, we respond to this truth. For those who are hurting here this morning, Father God, I pray that you would be with them. I pray that they would know that you are our firm foundation. And for those who've maybe come out of a season of great difficulty, and they, and they are standing, they are standing on all your promises that are yes and amen in, in Jesus. I pray that they might be able to look to those who are wrestling and encourage them and to say you are not alone, that, that in, in some ways that we might be an extension of Hebrews 12, 1, just part of this great cloud of witnesses that says, no, God, you love us. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.